Welcome back, everyone, to the Small is Bountiful webinar. My name is Ratana Chinpakti of the Too Big to Ignore Global Partnership for Small Scale Fisheries. And I am speaking to you from St. John's, Newfoundland, East Coast of Canada. The event is organized as part of the World Oceans Day 2020 to celebrate the importance of and contribution of small scale fisheries to ocean sustainability and innovation. We are emphasizing small scale fisheries in the discussion about ocean sustainability because small scale fisheries are not only too big to ignore, but they are also too important to fail. The event of this scale cannot happen without the effort and support of many people. We would like to acknowledge all the partner organizations, team members and staff, students and volunteers as well as the funders for the wonderful support. And of course, you know, the, all the speakers, the moderators, and also the audience. We have already covered quite a lot this week uh, from the impacts of COVID-19 on small scale fisheries around the world to the specific discussion about how to secure access to resources and markets for small scale fisheries. And yesterday topic, was about the nexus between small-scale fisheries and the SDGs for the future we want. By now, you might be wondering whether there are instruments or mechanisms that can be used to really help secure sustainable small-scale fisheries. And this is the topic of today's discussion. Then tomorrow, we would wrap up this wonderful week with a very important topic of social justice and equity. The webinar would challenge all of us to consider whether the so-called blue economy or blue growth initiatives are just another form, another form of blue washing at the expense of small-scale fisheries. So please join us again tomorrow for the discussion. Now, you, when you go to our video uh, YouTube playlist, you, you're going to start seeing the program for June 8. Remember that June 8th is the World Oceans Day and the theme of this year is about ocean innovation. Many people don't consider small scale fisheries to be very innovative, but we have already proven them wrong. And we would continue to do so with the event around the world, starting with a session about small scale fisheries in Australia and the Pacific Island, followed by a session about small scale fisheries in South and Southeast Asia then we would follow by the voices from the African continent. The next set of four sessions will be on similar topics that we have been uh, discussing this week. And now we have a very impressive list of speakers to talk about uh, um, the SDGs 14B, the SDGs and the small scale fisheries and um, the guidelines, uh, the small scale fisheries guidelines, which is a topic of today, and then blue justice. We would wrap um, June 8 with three more sessions on COVID-19, uh, starting from the global perspective. Then we go to the Gulf and the Caribbean, and then we go to the Latin America. But, um, but really it's about thinking about the post-COVID world more than anything else. So we hope that you would continue to join us during this week-long program and contribute your idea about what we can do together to support and promote sustainable small-scale fisheries and situate them uh, more centrally in the discussion about ocean sustainability. Your contribution will be part of the recommendations that we'll put together for the planning of the next ocean conference and for the preparation of the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture in 2022. Bienvenidos a webinar Lo Pequeño es Abundante. La sesión va a ser en inglés, pero puede seguirlo en español haciendo clic en el enlace de Google Doc. Usted también puede hacer preguntas en español en el chat y nosotros lo traduciremos por usted. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today. I would like to welcome Manas uh, Roshan to the studio. 
Manas is a program officer with the International Collective in support of fish workers. Many of you know this organization as ICSF. The headquarters in Chennai, India, but there are many offices and um, uh, staff members around the world. ICSF is an international non-governmental organization that works toward the establishment of equitable, gender-just, self-reliant and sustainable fisheries, particularly in the small-scale artisanal sector. ICSF is one of the lead organizing partners for this small is bountiful event, and um, Manas has been helping us um, throughout since uh, since the start of the planning, and 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 has been working uh, a lot to trying to get this program together. So really, thank you, Manas, for the work that you have been doing, and also um, for organizing this session. I would leave you at this, and uh, the studio is yours. Thank you, Ratna. And thank you to TBTI for organizing these uh, very, very informative and interesting series of webinars. Uh, it truly is a good way to use this crisis, uh, which keeps us all indoors to share important information and to also um, work towards change in small scale fisheries in the little ways that we can. Um, as she said, the program today is titled From Words to Action Using the Small-Scale Fisheries Guidelines and Human Rights for Sustainable Small-Scale Fisheries. Um, this is co-organized by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, and I really want to thank my colleagues at FAO, especially Lena, who put this program together um, so well uh, in organizing the speakers. Uh, and also inviting ICSF to moderate it. Um, and we have a very interesting lineup of speakers for you today, um, and I'll introduce them in just a minute. But before that, I just wanted to take you through the program um, and also tell you about some of the co-organizers in this uh, program that we have. So just going to show you the presentation here. Before we start, also, a word of thanks to the other co-organizers of this program, who are uh, DIHR, of course, who has one of the panelists um, uh, present at the session, Sophie Hansen, who is so instrumental in putting the um, session together, but also World Fish, uh, the IPC Fisheries Working Group, WFFP, the other speakers who we have present here. Um, as well as the Oak Foundation that's supporting this entire event and the series of programs, of course. So I think we can, though many of us are quite familiar with the small scale fisheries guidelines, I think we can assume that we have a few audience members here who are new to the subject and are also eager to find out about uh, the small scale fisheries guidelines. So I'll just, as briefly as possible, tell you a little bit about the history uh, of these guidelines and then go to introducing our speakers. So the guidelines really came out of the mood of the mid 2000s where uh, following the, the uh, code of conduct for responsible fisheries in 1995, which was the emphasis was very much on the conservation and the sustainable use of fish stocks and of fishing rights. Uh, from that we moved Quite, there was quite a journey towards recognition of the social development needs of fishing communities, men and women, and the very diverse communities around the world and their human rights as well. So the emphasis on this social development aspect, uh, an important pillar of sustainable development, which had uh, not got the adequate amount of attention which it needed Fish worker communities, their representative civil society organizations engaging with the FAO um, requested that we have a special instrument dedicated towards small scale fisheries and their human rights. And through a consultative ground up process that finally culminated in 2014 in the endorsement of the guidelines by the FAO Committee on Fisheries, um, that process was very much led by civil society organizations and the social movements, many of whom are present here and I'm hoping are also watching. And the 
central to the guidelines as we'll come to in the presentations by Sophie as well as from the ground stories that we'll hear from our other presenters, central to these guidelines is the human rights-based approach. Um, and within that human rights-based approach, though, uh, Sophie will go into it in some detail. What we're talking about are the rights that are contained in and derived from the UDHR, that's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and other instruments uh, that form the plethora of the human rights framework. Just to give you a brief idea of the small scale fisheries guidelines, as many of you know, the guidelines are divided into three sections. And these sections um, have, uh, of, of course, at their heart, which is the part two, is the thematic uh, sections of the guidelines. But before that, because we're talking about the human rights based approach, we need to talk about the objectives, the nature and scope the guiding principles, and of course, the relationship with other international instruments, which Sophie, our uh, presenter, will go into in some detail. And you'll see that the panel that we put together, FAO, TBTI, ICSF, and other partners on the 8th of June is going to go into some more detail on part two, which is the thematic sections of the guidelines, which many of you know quite well, which cover uh, these broadly, these areas of tenure, and resource management, social development, employment and decent, uh, decent work, value chains, post-harvest and trade, gender equality, disaster risks, and climate change. And some of these thematic um, areas will emerge in the conversation that we're going to have today as well. But finally, since it's been six years since the endorsement of the guidelines, the question is how successful have we been and where are we on the road to the implementation? And the part three of these guidelines is essential to that. Some of these enabling conditions and enabling environment that comes with the rule of law, accountability, the coordination and collaboration between institutions, um, which the guidelines goes into in some detail. And this is a video that FAO and many of us together prepared uh, just after the endorsement of the guidelines you'll see in this slide. I'm not going to show you the video, we'll link to it. But this image in many ways shows, as many of us who work on the course or in, with riparian communities, we know the maddening um, complexity of these social groups. And this graphic in some ways shows that complexity where it covers many of these areas that we looked at from the importance of women to the sector to the importance of participation, consultation, the importance of the very, very diverse value chains in small scale fisheries and at the core of it, the sustainable development uh, of fishing communities. So with that, I just want to introduce our speakers uh, to you all just very briefly. Um, I'll just bring them onto the screen to begin with. Our first speaker today is going to be Sophie Hansen from the Danish Institute of Human Rights, and she's based in Copenhagen. Hi, Sophie. Our next speaker will be Munir, and I'll give you a detailed introduction of all these speakers before their presentations. I just wanted to give them a chance to say hello to you. We have Mujibul Haq Munir from the Coastal Association for Social Transformation, Coast Trust, and he's based in Bangladesh. Next, we have Jeshu Ratnam, who's with the Social Need Education and Human Awareness, Sneha, in short, organization based in southern India on the east coast of South India. Hi, Jeshu. Then we have Suzanne. I hope you can see her on the screen. Uh, Suzanne Courier is with the African Women Fish Processors and Traders Network, in short, Off Fish Net, and she's based in uh, Tanzania. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, everybody. Hi. And finally, sorry, I have to fish these people out of their, this deck we have. Um, we have Vivian Solis Rivera, who is with the Cope Solidar Network in Costa Rica. And she's also a fond member of ICSF. Hi, Hello. Vivian. Hello. How? Yeah. 
So I'm just going to take you all off the deck for a minute so that I can introduce Sophie in some more detail, and then we can move on with the session. A quick introduction to Sophie. Sophie, an MSc in International Development Studies, works as an advisor for the Danish Institute of Human Rights, working with human rights and development. Since the adoption of the 2030 Agenda in 2015, the DIHR has been leading the way to show the concrete links between human rights and sustainable development goals, and to operationalize this mutually reinforcing connection in implementation. In this context, Sophie works to promote human rights in fisheries and aquaculture by documenting and addressing human rights implications to promote a sustainable development of the fisheries and aquaculture sectors. Thank you, Sophie. I'll let you take it from here. Um, Thank you very much, Manas, uh, and to all the organizers uh, for this opportunity to give a presentation um, and look into the relation between human rights and the SSF guidelines. We really appreciate this opportunity to, to share some of the insights that we have gathered uh, in the past years. So I would start out by trying to, to set the scene in terms of uh, the relation between uh, human rights and the SSF guidelines. And in order to really understand the relation between uh, human rights and the SSF guidelines, um, it can be helpful to make a distinction between uh, human rights uh, that are generally under uh, pen uh, human development and the fisheries and aquaculture sector, the uh, the outside circle, and the um, human rights included in the SSF guidelines, which is the inner circle. And this distinction really help us to uh, see that most human rights are actually uh, included directly in the SSF guidelines. Sophie, sorry to interrupt you. Would you like to just make it full screen, uh, slideshow mode? Your presentation. That's uh, not possible due to some computer settings. Okay, sorry, go on. But you can see my slide, right? Absolutely, yeah. Good, good. Um, yes. And when we look into the, the inner circle, um, we actually find references to a number of, hu of human rights standards from all human rights conventions in the SSF guidelines. We also find a number of labor standards uh, from several ILO conventions. Some of the rights uh, and labor standards that are featuring very centrally in the SSF guidelines are uh, the right to food, the right to an adequate standard of living, the right to health, the right to property, the right to non-discrimination and equality, the right to work and to free uh, choice of employment, labor rights, uh, the right to social security, the right to a healthy environment, the rights of indigenous peoples, political rights and fundamental freedoms, the right to remedy and cultural rights. So you can see this is already a long list, uh, though it's not fully comprehensive, but these are some of the rights that are central uh, in the SSF guidelines. Yes. <clears throat> this is a, an attempt to illustrate uh, this relation between the human rights uh, and the SSF guidelines uh, more uh, in detail. So when we look at the inner circle, the, the human rights and labor standards and principles that are uh, integrated into the SSF guidelines, we find them in, in all three parts that Manas was highlighting before in part one on the objectives and principles, part uh, two on the thematic uh, chapters, and uh, part three uh, on implementation. So uh, one key message is that the SSF guidelines should really be understood and interpreted in the light of the human rights standards uh, and labor standards. Next, when we look into um, the chapters, the thematic chapters uh, of the SSF guidelines uh, and the chapters in, in uh, part three, we see um, that SSF guidelines really contextualize 
the human rights and labor standards that are relevant to SSF uh, sector. Therefore, the implementation of the SSF guideline is designed to lead to a realization of human rights of small scale fishers, fish workers, and fishing communities. And to substantiate this, uh, Article 1.2 in the SSF guidelines clearly says that the guidelines uh, must promote um, the human rights based approach. One key uh, step in designing and implementing a human rights based approach is to draw on the human rights uh, standards uh, and the information that is coming from the human rights monitoring mechanisms. When you design a development initiative um, to uh, develop the sector and implement the SSF guidelines, a human rights based approach can be designed and implemented um, to all types of development initiatives. One example, in 2019, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights addressed the rights of small scale fishers to an adequate standard of living and recommended to Senegal that Senegal should ensure meaningful and effective participation of fishers concerned in the negotiation of fisheries agreement and strengthening the means of controlling overfishing with assistance from uh, cooperation of the international community when necessary. So what does this recommendation, this information from a UN uh, human rights monitoring mechanism tells us? It tells us that the UN, <coughs> sorry, that the UN monetary mechanisms have a, an eye in some cases on the human rights issues of small scale fisheries. And that a recommendation like this uh, should be integrating into the national development uh, initiatives on small scale fisheries, according to a human rights based approach. Such uh, it, this recommendation also highlights which human rights standards that are relevant to and that needs to be addressed to uh, to promote and protect the human rights of small scale fishers. The example highlights the right to an adequate standard of living and the right to participate in public life. So these uh, these rights and this type of recommendation needs to be integrated when countries develop the small scale fishery sector and can be uh, integrated into reform, legal reform processes, uh, policy processes, strategies and development programs. And with this example, also the human rights implications of small scale fishers on the, the right to adequate standard of living needs to be considered when, when government uh, develops fisheries agreement. So uh, the next slide is, a, is an illustration of how um, human rights standards have been contextualized in the SSF guidelines. The first right that I'm uh, mentioning is the right to an adequate standard of living, which is included in several uh, chapters and articles of the SSF guidelines. For instance, in, uh, in article 6.7, which is one example but there are other uh, articles and chapters where that right has been integrated. An example of a human rights standard, uh, which is uh, deriving from the Convention of, uh, Against Discrimination of Women, uh, Article 14.2, uh, describes standards on how elimination uh, of discrimination against women in rural areas are important and what the what that entails, um, for instance, ensuring their participation and benefit from rural development with an emphasis on their right to participate and elaborate in implementation of um, development planning at all levels. This is also integrated in several chapters of the SSF guidelines. The last example is the right to remedy, um, which um, uh, consist in many human rights uh, conventions. And this is contextualized, uh, for example, in SSF guideline article 5.11, uh, 
which states that small-scale fishing communities should have access to remedy through impartial and competent judicial and administrative bodies in a timely and affordable manner. And that remedy mechanisms must be effective means of resolving dis uh, disputes over tenure rights in according with national law. This very much uh, reiterates and match uh, human rights norms and standards on the right to remedy. So to speak about human rights-based approach to development, uh, it's important to, to highlight uh, where, um, what type of animal this is. Uh, it is a conceptual framework. Actually, we don't have a universal uh, recipe uh, for a human rights-based approach, but the UN uh, has set some standards um, in, back in 2003 for their own uh, developments uh, and how that the UN uh, mechanisms and, and institutions uh, should promote a human rights based approach in their development activities. Next we have um, some uh, standard setting uh, and, and norms development uh, from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which is the leading UN uh, entity on human rights. And they have developed a uh, a very useful publication uh, on frequently asked questions on human rights-based approach. This is the key uh, resource uh, for all types of actors. So human rights-based approach to development is a conceptual framework uh, and uh, it has its less directions in terms of how uh, principles to operationalize it. It really means that human rights is integrated into the, the goals, the level of the goals, in the development initiative and in the implementation of that development initiative. And uh, it's, it really highlights that the human rights principles of accountability, participation and non-discrimination needs to be uh, implemented throughout the, the development initiatives. It also says that human rights should be part of the monitoring and evaluation of the outcomes. And the last uh, key component is that the development initiative should build capacities of uh, the rights holders, in this case, small scale fishers, to claim their rights. But equally important, uh, the development initiative should build the capacity of duty bearers, the government authorities, um, on their uh, obligations and capacities to fulfill these rights. So it has a balanced approach in focusing on uh, rights and duties of, um, of both sides, you can say. Final slide. I can see my time is there running out. Um, <clears throat> I just want to, to direct you towards uh, some of these uh, resources that are out there uh, if you want to, to uh, um, promote a, and also implement a human rights based approach. The frequently asked question um, by OTHR. We have some uh, online uh, courses and learning materials uh, available for free online. Um, I can share the link. If you are a UN uh, institution, uh, there is a, a portal uh, on human rights based approach, uh, which is collecting uh, development initiatives uh, run by the UN organization um, that has applied a human rights based approach. Uh, and finally, uh, the FAO uh, is, uh, is uh, collecting a number of resources um, on human rights based approach to small scale fisheries on their website. Uh, and we are very keen to, to collaborate uh, with FAO and others uh, who want to, to really um, take uh, the human rights based approach forward. So get in contact with me uh, if you're interested to discuss more. Uh, and thanks to TBTI and all others for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Sophie. Thanks for that very interesting uh, presentation. And I think there'll be a lot of questions coming on the human rights based approach in practice, um, specifically to you after that little uh, lesson there. Uh, I'll just take you off the screen and introduce you all to our next speaker. Hi, Munit. Is your presentation Hi. on? Yes, you... it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay.
just to give you a brief uh, introduction to Munir's work, Munir, as I said earlier, is with the Coast Trust Bangladesh. Um, he has a postgraduate degree in political science and is active in the farmers and fishers social movements in Bangladesh. He is a co-chair of the Inland Fisheries Working Group of the World Forum of Fisher People, WFFP. He is also one of the steering committee members of the Farmers Forum of the International Fund for Agriculture and is elected CSO Asia representative to the steering committee of the Extraterritorial Obligation Council based in Geneva. He works as the joint director of Coast Trust, where he is the focal person for donor projects and programs. And it's a good way to also lead from um, Sophie's presentation because they have an ongoing project to look into human rights concerns in Bangladesh. So with that, Munir, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator Manas Roshan. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, TVTI, and also the, all the organizers and all the people and behind this uh, very nice uh, event. Before uh, going to my presentation, I, I would like to mention just one thing uh, that uh, whenever I talk about small scale fisheries guideline, I really become emotional uh, because uh, I would like to uh, remember one lady uh, because she is Chandrika, Chandrika Sharma uh, who, who made me involved in the national consultation process of the SSF guideline in Bangladesh and also I was I, I feel uh, very much fortunate that I was present in the FAO session when uh, the guideline was endorsed and that was possible due to this uh, uh, ICSF and Chandrika Sharma. So I before going to my presentation, I would like to salute and uh, to Chandrika Sharma. Uh, I would like to present the uh, small scale fisheries sector uh, very brief because even though it is a small scale uh fisheries of bangladesh but this the, the sector is very big very large and uh, uh, it is uh, about 20 million people are directly or indirectly uh, involved with this sector and uh, what is the status of ssf guideline implementation in bangladesh in fact uh, it is not a priority for the government because if you go to the uh, department of fisheries or minister of fisheries yes bangladesh was uh, part of the fao, uh, FAO uh, or coffee and Bangladesh also endorsed this guideline, but uh, there are other development uh, issues uh, for this for, for the department, and they are very much focused on other policies, plan, and, and support, but which which indirectly uh, support the guidelines uh, standard. But the guideline itself is not a, a big or small agenda for the Department of Fisheries. They have their uh, special vision and special investment plan, special five-year plan for the Ministry of uh, uh, Fisheries and also the Department of Fisheries, which is very big department in our country. In every sub-districts, there, there is a office, there is an office of the Department of Fisheries. And also, if you go to the Department of Fisheries or the Ministry of Fisheries, you will find that they have a special map on, on um, even SDGs uh, targets and goals. So. This is the status of SSF guidelines implementation in, in, in Bangladesh. And then uh, what is the status of uh, the small scale fishers uh, in, in our country? And that uh, there is a huge confusion about the uh, uh, definition of SSF or who are the small scale fishermen. This is a very confusing term in our country because if you, go, if you check all the rules, laws and policies of our Bangladeshi, uh, uh, related with the fisheries sector, you will find the word in English like fishermen, but not small scale fishermen. But, but who are the fishermen? Even some fish businessmen who have their own plane are the fishermen. So there is a demand from the from the CSO and fishermen organization that there should be a definition. But we are very much lucky enough that uh, some some years ago, for some specific project, government has. Uh, defined in some category which also relate to this SSF, but there is no specific uh, uh, definition of SSF. And uh, you know that in, in our country, most vulnerable people uh, uh, due to the climate change is the small scale fishers people because they live in the coastal areas or the riverine area, river uh, areas, but there is no special social safety nets or special quota for the fishermen. There are some uh, there are uh, a very close uh, or banned season in our country in some areas 
now a ban is going on on hilsha fishing or, or or and sometimes there are a ban on totally fishing in 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 some particular areas uh, as a compensation government is providing some ration but uh, in it, it, there is there a huge concern that uh, most of the fishermen are not get that ration because they are not registered government is in a process to register all the fishermen and uh, due to the uh, pressure and demand that uh, you we should uh, provide id cards for the fish fishermen and now uh, fishermen are getting id cards and but still the people who are who have got id card even they are not uh, getting the uh, ration because government is under process hope this problem will be solved uh, soon and the support is uh, which is being provided to the fishermen during the uh, ban period is also not that much adequate because uh, there are some uh, 40 kgs rice and something like that, which is for three months or uh, two months, which is also not adequate. This is this struggle of uh, SSF uh, people in our country. And uh, uh, access uh, rights to many open water bodies are being exclusively uh, given to politically influential people because, you know, uh, there is for, uh, for le giving le lease to the uh, of the uh, open water bodies, there is a provision that uh, fishermen association should get this list. But who are leading the fishermen association? Not the small scale fishermen, because in some sub district or district, you will find that the most senior political leader. And uh, uh, health services for the fishermen you know even though we have now uh, uh, government is trying to provide health services uh, improve the health services but the health services for the especially for the fishermen who are living in the remote uh, island we call chor or um, sandbar island or all the or, or in the isolated uh, islands they are very much a lake, lake of uh, health services not only health services also the schools and other right, uh, rights are not that much uh, addressed by the government or something like that. And market access is a big challenge. They are not getting market access because in some cases, the access to the uh, formal source of uh, money is not in place. And that is why, uh, especially the fish workers, uh, they, have, they have to sell their uh, labor in, in, in advance. And so there is no uh, so, so there is no uh, formal source of uh, fund, and they they are, they are not getting formal credit. So, the sole um, agency is is for the middlemen because they they are in advance they buy uh, their catch, and health services is in, in, inadequate. And if you talk about uh, safe employment or decent employment, we are very much unfortunate that in in our in our country we are still struggling to ensure. There are some provisions from the government laws and regulations, but still the implementation process or implementation status is not at a desired level. And if you talk about uh, vulnerability to the climate change, these people are severely vulnerable because uh, you know Bangladesh is one of the most vulnerable countries due to the climate change. And we are still a lot of uh, thing to do uh, to, to, to make this, uh, to keep these people out of the vulnerability. Uh, as Manos was saying that uh, 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 in Bangladesh, uh, with the support of DIHR, uh, Coast Trust and uh, Manusha Jana Foundation and Bills, this, these three organizations were very much lucky that uh, I'm proud of, especially because uh, Coast, I'm working with Coast Trust. We are in a process of a sector-wide impact assessment, especially focusing, focusing uh, on the human rights issues and uh, from our our research findings uh, is with us and uh, we have found that more than 77 percent fish workers or fishers recruited upon verbal agreement for a specific time there is no written agreement there is no level law is is is, uh, is applicable there and working hours is 40 to 70 hours per week and they also stay at the sea for 8 to 24 days in a row so life jackets and net drum are main source of safety at sea and no communication signals available still now, even though some, some mobile signals are working, but uh, when, when, when our fish, fish workers are going to deep sea, they don't know what is going on in the uh, mainland. And uh, from, from this research, we have also found that 
there are about half year ban on some main fisheries areas and no right to fishing you cannot uh, fishing at all for uh, or almost half of the year and and uh, as i mentioned earlier the ration the compensation uh, given by the government is very much inadequate and hampering their right to food definitely and usually there is no treatment facilities other than primary treatment facilities available in both and uh, and uh, need to carry emergency treatment cost on their own. The boat owners, they don't take any responsibility of the fishermen. Uh, they are sending the deep sea for the fish catch and very poor arrangement to fight disaster risk, as I, I mentioned earlier. And uh, also there are some other findings that there is no insurance insurance is available for fishermen. There is a uh, uh, there is an initiative from the government to to implement an insurance uh, scheme but th this is not in in place still now but and wages are very low considering the type of fishermen who are family needs physical and mental distress and this and fishers do not know the real price of the fish sold because fishermen they have the duty to catch the fish and submit it on give it to the middleman or the uh, owner of the boat she he or she or they don't know the price, they don't have the right to even ask the price because the price will be determined by the owner of the boat. So this is very crucial for us and we're working. And But there are some changes. There are some changes and uh, 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 organizations like uh, Bangladesh Fish Workers Alliance and Coast Trust the, and, we are, and our networks, we are trying to raise the issues. But one big, prob big problem here is that uh, the, the uh, Organizational strength of fish workers uh, in our country is very poor. They are not that much organized, but now we are working on this and we have some very uh, strong organizations. Uh, they are emerging and we are raising, for example, you can see a photo that, uh, that we, we organized a seminar uh, with the presence of the member of parliaments and the minister and also the high officials from the Department of Fisheries. And we, 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 we placed our demand uh, with, the, with, the, with a very short position paper uh, that this is the cause and impact of your ban. And this is the, our recommendation for the welfare of the fishermen. So these are, and uh, some, some things are happening and some uh, voices are, have been heard from, from, the, from the government. So we think we'll be able to change the scenario in, in near future. Uh, other efforts are also going on as Manos uh, as mentioned that uh, with the support of um, the DIHR, we are implementing a research project and uh, we are uh, we have the report with us and what is the from this uh, uh, research we'd like to get or document and very systematically systematically that the whole the a photo of the whole uh, uh, sector of, of the fishery sector of Bangladesh and uh, we'll capture the scenario uh, with recommendation, technical recommendation, academic recommendations, and recommendations from the fishermen. And with this recommendation, we believe that we'll, we'll place it, uh, we'll document it, we'll place it with the um, uh, uh, policy makers, and we hope that these documentations and this, this report will be a very big tool uh, to advocacy with the policy makers, and we'll definitely try to do that. I think this was my very short presentation as I was uh, uh, I was asked to do a very short presentation and that is why uh, I would like to thank you everyone and thanks Manos and, and thanks once again uh, TVTI and everyone who is listening to us. Thank you very much. Thank you Munir for telling us about the situation in Bangladesh. I'm sure there's already questions coming in to you which we'll pass on to you at the end of the session. Um, just to listeners who are tuning in right now, we urge you to pay close attention, but also to send us any questions you have, which we'll take at the end. You can paste them in the chat, the comment box you see on your YouTube window. With that, I'll introduce our next speaker. Munir, I'm taking you into the deck. Okay. Hi, Jeshu. Uh, I'm going to uh, just yeah. share your screen. Um, I'm sorry, I'll share at my end. Yeah. One second. I'll just introduce you.
Okay. As I said, uh, Jeshu is with Sneha. She leads Sneha, which is an NGO based in India. She's a law graduate and is active in fisheries, women, and other social movements in India and elsewhere. She is an executive committee member of the National Fishworker Forum, the core committee member of the Women's Forum of the NFF, and a convener of the Coastal Action Network based in India. She's also an active member of the Ocean Grabbing and Women's Working Groups of the World Forum of Fisher People, WFFP. She's selected as an IPC member representing WFFP for this session. As I was saying, she's the director of Sneha, and Sneha works for livelihood rights of fisher communities and protection and promotion of coastal ecology, and this worked for the last 35 years in these issues. I'll just take myself off the window uh, issue and then we can start. Yeah. Okay, can I start? Yeah, can I start? Yes, yeah, just now. Start, yeah, um, now here the first slide just shows mm. this Bangladesh slide, not my. Okay, I'll start, but with the Manas, this is Bangladesh slides on the uh, screen, not uh, mine. Sorry, Jeshu, one sec, that's my bad. Okay, so what do you want me to do? One minute, I'll, I'll just share your screen. You shared first, first when you initially yeah, shared, seems... my screen came. First slide was there. Yeah, this is my uh, presentation. And thank you uh, for this opportunity for having uh, to have present the uh, human rights issues related to SSF. And uh, when, I, um, when I talk of uh, human rights, we are basically uh, NFF and WFP also believe that they are collective rights and of the uh, fishery sector. And uh, so SSF especially, the collective rights, um, uh, uh, it's based, this SSF guidelines is based on human rights based approach. Human rights, we believe that they are, uh, the rights are interrelated, interdependent and include civil, political, economic and social and cultural rights. And uh, human rights are poor, poor, with special attention to poor communities, especially women, children that are most marginalized. So, and states are duty bearers and are obliged to respect, protect and fulfill human rights for all people emphasize. And it emphasizes on states as the duty bearers. So with this background, I will just uh, go to the next slide. Um, next slide is about uh, uh, what Manas already explained. So this is, uh, though there is a, a stress on SSF, uh, SSF, the uh, small the, the guidelines, VG SSF guidelines, really talks of SSF as most vulnerable, marginalized group, especially women. But uh, we know what the real situation is. Next, um, next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, um, now SSF and uh, the issues in this blue economy era. Um, the issues of uh, SSF, though it is uh, again and again stressed on human rights based approach, the guidelines are evolved. SSR, SSF are denied of their historical customary rights. That is what I earlier mentioned about collective community rights transferred through generations. Um, it's mostly it uh, here in reality, it goes to industry uh, industries taking over the rights of small scale fisheries. The ocean and its resources, coastal land and its resources are now under the control of the state. Earlier, state played a role. They were the custodians of the ocean and coastal commons to protect the prom and promote the rights of the coastal communities. But now, in this blue economy era, state claims absolute ownership and give permission to private investors to profit making by legitimately exploitations they claim it sustainable of ocean sustainable exploitation of ocean and coastal resources to enhance the economic growth of the nation in international code of conduct for responsible fisheries and vgssf are not binding 
they are they are only a guidelines and in mo no way binds the nation and it is up to the nation to implement or not and it is the depends upon the political will of the each nation next so next slide talks about uh, what we see in this be era and this covid situation see in this covid situation um, we have the uh, scheme blue revolution and uh, it's already came into be uh, the neel kranti and which talk which really uh, talks of and gives priority to um, industrial mostly not culture fisheries and not the capture fisheries so the capture fisheries even the fund if you look into the fund allocations and the schemes of the um, government's uh, total project and total policy it will be clearly seen that um, the there's a shift from um, capture to culture and to, and and also for industrial culture so more and more fund allocations are towards the city. so in this situation we can one can imagine what will be the situation of uh, ssf uh, for the coast and the ocean commons next so we i let, just i wanted to stress and say that it leads to disposition of the coast and coastal commons for the ssf and especially women now talking about the national coastal mission mof and climate change they talk about uh, uh, they emphasize and they talk about um, the national coastal mission talks about the uh, space climate change issues and other things but we have to it, it talks about not only conserve the coastal environment but also promote development generation to generate a revenue but that the whole process of marine spatial planning done in the country and in different parts of the world different countries of the world clearly it is Uh, it shows that the coast and the ocean commons has to be shared with different industrial sector the fisheries have to share with the different industries and uh, whatever what are all the components of blue economy all the components need to share the coast and then where will be the space for uh, ssf and that will definitely displace and also make the communities uh, vulnerable and uh, so the question of uh, ssf their safeguarding their rights is really at stake having said this ssf and also we should talk of uh, national wild life action plan this talks of conservation very good if we have to conserve we have to conserve the uh, uh, ecological systems ecosystems and other things but when it uh, talks of conservation sites um, it denies ssf or in many places uh, are denied of their fishing rights in the declared marine conservation sites so but whereas other industrial projects are allowed in the conservation site like exploration oil drilling etc which is also the same situation in other parts of the world other countries coastal states next um so these are some efforts to policy level issues related to ssf Uh, what uh, nff and other um, in relation uh, to the policy level issue how we have responded as a collective so when neel kranti mission in 2016 came we have drafted uh, objections and uh, really played an advocacy role to show that this is this does not address the take, consider the uh, issues of ssf and which needs to be given more focus and the such sections should be removed or the entire policy should be read after then again come came the national policy on marine fisheries 2017 and this was again followed up by the bill 2019 and now again in national fisheries policy 2020 in this covid situation so all this has a different uh, more or less the same thing different sections concentrate and try to uh, take away the rights it's against the ssf so uh, national fish workers forum with other uh, collect their unions the uh, member organizations has raised their objections saying that this is not in favor of ssf and it is against ssf so it has to be reconsidered and in such a situation of covid situation this law or policy cannot be implemented 
Then there comes the mariculture policy, which came first in 2018 and 2019. For this, we have strongly put our to objections to withdraw the policy, as it is not in favor of SSF. Next. SSF, including women, are becoming really invisible in spite of VGSSF. Though there is VGSSF, it doesn't have a binding uh, condition or for implementation by the states. So it's only a voluntary guidelines which in that has made uh, so many changes and so many things which the state at its own will has brought. So transition from co closed access to open access system is a really a big threat to the uh, SSF. Transition from fishing as way of life and to commodification of fishery sector for profit is another issue. Mechanization and modernization of gears and crafts, transition from traditional ecological knowledge-based fishing to technology dependent communities. We have made technology dependent communities. This is another big issue. Promotion of deep sea fishing uh, for tuna fisheries, exclude small scale traditional fishes from the captured fisheries who are already involved for so many years and years and years. Promotion of extensive culture fisheries or diminishing the SSF in capture fisheries. The, cap the percentage of capture fisheries and the output in India is nearly only 30% or 29%, whereas the uh, culture fishery is nearly 71%. This is government data. And so we just wanted to say, and Portland development growth, in the coastal villages, and they are uh, demarcated as coastal economic zone. In the southern India, specific reference to southern India, nearly Tamil Nadu itself, there are more, more than four uh, coastal economic zones, and uh, then uh, which are which are which leads to uh, explore which are all the projects are uh, name any project exploration of uh, projects leads to destruction of uh, coastal fishing grounds. Then there are industrial development, there are port development attached to all these uh, economic zones. And these economic zones uh, are marked as, and it takes away their coastal lands uh, where, where communities live. And so this is a big threat um, for the coastal, especially small scale fishermen and women in, uh, especially, because they are the most people who are uh, catering to the domestic market and also vendors who really use the space and they are under threat now. Labor abuses are evident both at ocean and at coast in global seafood supply chains. Feminization of poverty, labor and violence, including child labor, especially in Kadalu, Ramna district and Nagapatnam district, where I work and Kanyakumari, it's visible. Women are displaced, women are not having space no access to the markets and no access to the even landing centers nowadays. Uh, so that rights is a really, uh, it is becoming more, uh, this is a threat to women, not only women, but also including uh, small scale fisheries and especially women. So denial of social, economic, uh, ecological and political rights resulting in disposition of governance and customary rights over ocean and uh, coastal commons is the end result. So here, I would like to say that the, uh, we have to more and more talk of governance rights. And uh, when you talk of tenure, it should be a collective rights, which leads to governance rights of the uh, coastal commons. And coast, com the commons includes ocean commons as well as the land, uh, coastal lands. So that the, col the collective government governance rights should be more stressed and more looked into. And that should be more promoted if we really uh, want the SSF uh, to be, uh, they are already becoming invisible. They should be extinct here. So they, they should exist here. They should not become extinct. So for that, we have to give more concentration on governance rights and especially the collective governance rights. Thank you. Thanks, Jeshu. Um, one second, I'll just take you off just to our co-organizers, speakers, as well as our audiences. I think we're a little short on time. So we're going to try and go through the other presentations as quickly as possible, and then hopefully have enough time to address many of your questions that you've been putting to us. Our next speaker is Suzanne. Suzanne, I'm just going to share your screen. 
just a quick introduction. Susanna, you just uh, your presentation, please. Uh, do you have it? Just a clarification. I got it wrong. Susan's actually from Kenya, but OfficeNet is based in Tanzania. That was my mistake. But as she says, we're all world citizens. So she forgives me for the mistake. <laughs> Susan, right. uh, I'm still trying to get my screen. I don't know if it's disappeared. Um, Technology. Could you just yeah open your presentation? Yes. Yes, you do. Make it uh, yeah. I'll just quickly introduce you. Susan trained in community development and counseling and has in the past worked for development organizations. She owns a fish farm and interacts across entire the, the entire fish value chain. She's the current first vice president of Offish Net and vice chair of the African Women in Agribusiness Network Kenya, secretary general of Commercial Aquaculture Society of Kenya, the chair of the Fishery Subsectors Board of Kenya Private Sector Alliance. She's also a trainer. Susan is passionate about what she does and believes, given a chance, rights linkage provided with an enabling environment each person's story can have a happy ending. Thanks for that introduction, uh, Suzanne. Uh, I'll just get myself yeah. off the screen. You can make All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Manas. And thank you, everybody, for um, this wonderful opportunity um, to have a platform to be able to talk about um, fisheries. So if we look at the background of fisheries... Susan, in sorry to interrupt. Would you like yes. to just make yours on, in uh, the slideshow mode at the bottom? Yeah. Is it now better? Yes. It is? Yes, please continue. Just a minute. Okay, is that, is that better? The previous... Can you hear me? I... Yes, I can. Yeah, just uh, I've gone back make, to yeah. the is that okay? Absolutely. I'll just go yeah. off the screen now. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon once again, and thank you very much uh, to TBTI and everybody for this wonderful opportunity. So my conversation uh, contribution to the conversation is how can the voice of women in small scale fisheries be strengthened? Um, I looked at a bit of the background. And I say that historically, fishing has always been a male-dominated sector. The perception when people say fisheries, uh, people think that it's only limited to fishing and that the actors here are only the fishermen. Forgetting that the fish's journey from the water to the consumer has been made possible by the efforts of both women and men, and that each one has their place and role in the value chain. Women's contribution to the fishing sector has been undervalued overlooked and also ignored in most cases, yet they play an essential and critical role in small-scale fisheries value chain. They also often face discrimination and violence, and few, very few do own resources such as boats and the nets, and maybe the land for culture fisheries, and remember that they are very underrepresented in decision-making bodies. I think that to strengthen the voice of the woman um, in small-scale fisheries, one needs to look at the entire fisheries value chain and identify where men and women have deeper footprints. Is it in the inputs? Is it in production? Is it in trade? Is it in processing? Or is it in markets? The number of women working in this sector has increased significantly in the last, say, 20, 30 years. And in the last number of years, their presence and impact is felt more in the trade, processing, and markets. So what are some of the barriers or challenges uh, that women encounter? I think a few of these are the social cultural barriers. The mindset that fisheries is a men's domain. Um, our cultures and traditions in some cases uh, do not allow women into waters or to have water related um, activities or near men. Um, and I think as women who are uh, being the major actors in processing and trade, they're also left out in the decision making process because you find that the thought process is that because the fish comes from the water, the guys who deal with it at the beginning are really the people to make the decisions. 
Uh, we also find that in accessing the raw materials to process, women are sometimes finding themselves very vulnerable to abuse and they are really being taken advantage of. And this is the case of sex for fish uh, trade that we've been hearing quite a bit. And we need to look for ways and means of putting structures and systems into place to be able to create a level, a level playing field so that we can be able to er eradicate this, 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 this challenge. Um, you realize that women not only have to take care of their household tasks, but also have the responsibility of contributing to their family's welfare through their economic activities. And this balance um, at times does make us uh, miss out on important opportunities where would have, we would have had impact um, and great inputs. The reason being, um, when meetings are held, we are either at the farms or household chores. So um, it becomes a, very, a bit difficult uh, for us to manage, um, to balance our time. Then the other thing that I realize is, um, and that we will notice is that uh, not all women actors in the small scale fishery sector are organized into formal groups. This really truly negatively affects their participation in having a voice in the decision making or being heard and had their, having their issues addressed. Um, and part of this, of course, is inad inadequate resources to help establish or to strengthen the existing national organizations, um, and which also becomes a barrier to their growth and progress. For example, if somebody would want to either fund, um, say, uh, women, you do not have collateral otherwise, but maybe collateral through the group, you're not a member of the group, you end up missing out. But remember that group dynamics has also been uh, a bit of a challenge. So we need to work towards strengthening um, women in groups, in associations, in cooperatives, for them to be able to rise up um, to the occasion. What do I think are some of the possible solutions or interventions? Of course, there should be change in perception. And this, I believe, can be done through inclusive engagement with both uh, men and women. And it will also help uh, avoid disrespect to culture and traditions. We should be very careful to avoid discrimination of the males, as this sends out the wrong signals. Remember, in the last number of years, um, it has been a lot has been said about the girl child. And of course, um, there is worry about uh, the boy child being marginalized. So in our conversations, they should be inclusive. Um, I also think that uh, by understanding the role of women and gender, it will help in, defect, in um, developing effective policies, regulations and programs that would strike a balance between sustainability and viability of the small scale fisheries sector. If women could be empowered with skills and knowledge to influence policies that have an impact on their families, on their lives and livelihoods, and on the sector as a whole, I think it would be a wonderful win-win. We need to integrate women into fisheries management right from the grassroots level, the BMUs, all the way to, to the global uh, platforms. I also feel that a quota system should be put in place that ensures a minimum number of women um, are put into executive positions in the sector because uh, that truly is an area where um, we are missing. Uh, good policies uh, create an enabling environment. And so with clear policies in place, there will definitely be transparency, accountability, effectiveness um, of the affirmative action programs. We have many affirmative action programs if you look over the world. But why are some of them not, um, not very effective? Um, that begs a discussion maybe for another day. But I think that with uh, clear policies, we can be able to get that uh, going in the right direction. Again, through the opportunities to participate in training and skills development activities, women will definitely, and I say this again, definitely increase productivity, improve on the quality of their products, be able to access um, even uh, bigger and more markets, and increase profitability, thereby being uh, strengthening the economic, uh, economic situation. Again, if we improve on women's financial resi resilience, and strengthen their participation in local value chains, including product diversification. Does fish just have to be sold as whole fish? Are there many other products that we can look at? Can we make fish products affordable, accessible, available, right from the lowest uh, person, um, low income person to the high end person? Can we have products that can actually fit um, all people across board 
meaning that we would also be improving on nutrition. So if we create uh, awareness of opportunities to reduce post-harvest losses, this too would lead to improvement in household incomes uh, for women and for the families. What is my way forward? Um, women in SSF should come together in organized groups because this will help them to galvanize their voices as actors. This also gives them an opportunity not only to participate in decision making, engage in democratic processes at various levels, but it truly helps them gain greater networks, linkages, and positions them from local up to the global level. Um, the organization I represent, which is Officenet, um, I believe is one of the very successful continental networks, which currently has a membership of 28 countries, and is hoping to increase membership uh, within the next three years to cover all the countries on the continent um, and bring more women on board. With injection of resources to Officenet, we would be able to fulfill our mandate, which includes establishing and strengthening national organizations, structures um, and whose existence and vibrancy would then enrich uh, women's influence. And uh, towards my end is that uh, there is need to lift the African small scale fisheries actors into the global processes. We also have uh, to urgently address uh, better data collection and we need to account and acknowledge uh, women's efforts and their role and impact in the entire value chain. In all this, let's not uh, ignore to address climate change and dis disaster risks. Um, research uh, universities are something that we tend to is it shy away or they tend to shy away from us. I believe that collaboration with the universities and research institutions should be a, a continuous process. Best practices, standards, standards, and standards and technology should be incorporated through the entire value chain. So by strengthening um, the voices of women, by enhancing the decision-making, power in fisheries management, in financial management, and in the fisheries value chain, I believe it would help ensure that there will be a more sustainable fishery sector and guarantee fish for the future. Thank you very much. Asante Sara, as we say in East Africa, and shukran. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for that very, very illuminating presentation. We have our last speaker, Vivian, and I'll just bring her up here. Hi, Vivian. I'm just going to share your presentation. Just a brief introduction to Vivian. Vivian is part of the COPE Solidar RL a Cooperative for Social Solidarity based in Costa Rica that promotes the conservation of biological and cultural diversity as a main asset for local community resilience. Working in Central America, the cooperative aims to strengthen the capacity of small scale fisheries and promote a human rights based approach to conservation of marine resources and a fair and just distribution of the benefits derived from its use. She works on community-based and shared governance models and has promoted civil participation in policy making that strengthens a human rights-based approach to marine conservation and small-scale fisheries. Vivian, welcome. And I'll just get myself off the deck. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Manas. And let me just share a paragraph in Spanish. Muy buenos días y gracias por estar con nosotros a todos los eh, hispanoparlantes que nos acompañan. Por favor, hay traducción del proceso en la página web. Ojalá se puedan unir. Y las preguntas que tengan en español serán traducidas al inglés. Así que muchas gracias por acompañarnos. I would like to thank very much uh, TBTI for having uh, me in this interesting panel, FAO, ICSF, to um, organize all these uh, different people talking about such interesting issues and subjects that are of such importance. So thank you very much. Um, the next, please. I am um, sharing with you some ideas uh, that are very important for us working in the field in Central America's uh, small scale fishers. And is the role that the work with young fishermen and fisherwomen uh, 
the need of doing this work in a framework of the guidelines, of the SSF guidelines. And this has to do that fishers are small scale fishers from day one. And you can see in this picture that uh, most of our women bring their young babies since they are very, very small to work with them at the beach. Next, please. Um, so uh, time goes very fast. And in a very, very short period of time, uh, Elian, that was a kid a few years ago, now is one of the best fishers in Kabuja. And this time that goes so fast is very important for strengthening a human rights-based approach to marine um, use, resources use. Next, please. So, next, please. So for our small scale um, young fisher workers, this is where they acquire knowledge. This is the big library, a big diversity of ecosystems, a big diversity of resources that they can use, and then they can share the knowledge with their families and how to use them sell them and produce uh, well-being for their families. Youth usually are also very good at technology. So, so we have to add now to this learning library technology also that they manage very easily in our um, areas or in their areas of work. Next, please. So the first idea is that small scale fishing uh, work permits that intergenerational transference of knowledge occurs. And this is a very deep idea in the sense that it is here where we are going to follow upon traditional knowledge that guarantees the sustainability of small scale fisheries into the future. Youth today, they support the families, they can be part of the um, small scale fishing organizations. And in some cases, they can go and study. And in this sense, they can bring hope and new ideas to the community members. They are eventually the next generation of fishers in the community. And some of them will be the future leaders that will defend the ideas that they believe are important for their collective uh, governance of their marine territories. Next. Today, they are worried about non-sustainable use of sea resources. They perceive small-scale fisheries as a way to move on from the economic point of view, because in some of these communities, opportunities, because we have marginalized these communities, are not there to move on. And they are learning. They are strengthening their capacities if taken into account. In some cases, they are defending their territories of life from narcotraffic and some, from some other interests, economic interests that are coming to these areas uh, very strongly. Next. It is also here where young women and young men have start having different opportunities. And this is very important because it's in this period of time where a lot of exclusion and marginalization, violence to women occur. And it's a period of time where we can start changing the situation to a human rights-based approach that con considers equity as a main issue to, for discussion. So um, when we look at the guidelines, they are very clear that we should include the work with youth and strength the capacity of fisher organizations in bringing in all the knowledge brought and that um, young fishers have. And this is a very key issue in the aspects that have been discussed previously. It's young fishers who will fight for this collective governance rights that need to be set in place in these marine territories or not. And we have an opportunity working with them to move on to um, have these leaders fighting for the right things in the future. And uh, having um, some activities, as the ones you see in the pictures with them, we do perceive that there's a strong need for supporting a movement that works with young fishermen and fisherwomen for the future. So we have a homework. Next, please. And the homework is to open spaces for the young fisher folks to rediscover 
their history with pride. And this is very important in areas where we are trying to change small scale fisheries to move into other economic uh, um, productive activities. We have a homework of strengthening the capacity of their work in the coastal and marine territories, and especially to bring availability for official recognition. This is licenses or permits for them to develop their work with dignity. In a lot of these areas, there are no permits, no formality for young fishers to move on in small scale fisheries. Next, please. So um, in the guidelines framework, we do dream about um, small scale fisher youth participating intensely in policy formulation and subjects of their interest. We dream about small scale youth having access and capacity development in technology, information and communication system and its benefits and bringing that into their communities. We hope to have young fisher women accessed to decent work and dignity in the work that they do and education that will be available for this young fisher women and men in all these small scale fishing territories. Also, we need to look after a healthy and positive intergenerational exchange of knowledge that will bring all this knowledge into the future and into the sustainable use of the resources. Next, please. So let me um, finish mentioning this uh, case that we had in 2008, we were able to bring small scale fishing representatives from Central American Congresses to the World Conservation Congress in Jeju. And uh, the bo boy in the red shirt, he was 29 at that moment, and he was a young fisher of Tarcoles community. Next, please. And he told us at that moment, that for a young fisher to be taken into account at decision making and to have this type of activity meant a big responsibility. And Gilberto was 29 years old when he went to Jeju. Today, he is 40, 40 and he is the proud manager of Copetarcoles, uh, uh, the fishing cooperative in the Pacific, Central Pacific of Costa Rica in his community. And he has founded uh, and this cooperative was founded by his father, who was also a fisher. So um, long processes uh, of fight for human rights and the fight for collective governance rights are crucial. But this is not happening in a short time. We need leaders and people to defend this approach in the future. Uh, young fishermen and fisherwomen are very important agents of change. They can positively influence and strength and move small scale fishing organizations toward the defense of their rights and to manage adequately their marine territories of life. Thank you very much. Thank you for that inspiring presentation, Vivian. Um, I'm just gonna bring our speakers back up and then we can take some questions Apologies to the audience that we've gone a little bit over time, but if you're all willing to stay, we'll have a rich discussion. Munir, could you turn on your video? Yeah. Um, we already have a great bunch of questions here. I'll start off by just flagging one from Muniba. Um, let me just bring it up to the screen. And this is for Sophie. Sophie Muniba, who is a TBTI member based in South Africa, she asks, can you explain how small scale fisheries can use UDHR and SSF guidelines with a soft clause? She means the guidelines are a soft law when they are not protected in national fisheries law, as the rights are violated, loss of livelihoods, food, tenure. Would you like to take that? Yes, I would like to. Thank you so much, uh, Muniba, for that uh, very, very good question. I think it's at the heart of uh, this discussion uh, and how we move forward. There is a little bit of uh, noise on the, maybe my colleague can turn off the microphone. Yeah, the rest of us can mute ourselves. Sorry, go on. 
So um, the central answer is that the, the the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the SSF guidelines are, as you say, not a hard law, but they link uh, to specific hard law, international hard law, the articles in the conventions. So when we understand which article in the UDHR and the SSF guidelines that links and is underpinned by a, a, a legal standard, then uh, we can have a different types of steps that, that small-scale fishers can take. Uh, but all of those steps starts with a documentation of uh, the human rights issue in, in CENSA, which is uh, an example that we are working on with Munia and our partners in Bangladesh, is to this first step is really to document what are the human rights issues. And then that can be used for an documentation can be used for a number of purposes. Uh, like we're doing in Bangladesh, it's to seek a, a dialogue a, and a advocacy a, with government authorities. But another approach could also be to uh, file a, a complaint uh, using the human rights mechanisms that support the implementation of the conventions. That can be directly uh, with um, the international mechanisms, or it can be at a national level with the National Human Rights Commission, and thereby getting uh, support uh, on these rights claims. Um, and uh, an important element uh, could be to, to seek collaboration with human rights organizations in this endeavor of documenting the issues. Uh, and just want to highlight that the webinar uh, on the 2nd of June, I, I explained a little bit more in depth about the human rights mechanisms and how they can be useful for small scale fishers. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Um, I would have loved to allow all our speakers to respond to these questions, but the way we've, there's so many, the way we've organized is to have one for each of you. And then if we have more time, we can come back to the rest. Munir, the next one is for you. It's from Shishir Pradhan. Um, how human rights and the market process trade-offs are dealt in Bangladesh fisheries policy framework. I'm not sure if okay. I follow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, C.C. Pradhan, for the question. In fact, if you go to the uh, national fishery strat strategy in our country, the marketing access is uh, very much focusing. And the government has, uh, has emphasized on this because, you know, there is a shift change uh, in fishery resources in our country. Once upon a time, 90% fish resources uh, was collected from the fish capture. But now it is uh, aquaculture, which is uh, contributing 56% percent about 60 percent of fisheries catch or fisheries resources so bangladesh is working on it and uh, recently bangladesh government has opened an online uh, marketing also uh, facilities for fishermen and they are um, establishing and building fish landing points in different uh, remote islands so it is going on and fisheries market still is a big challenge but uh, some initiative uh, initiatives are there there are going on thank you very much that actually brings us to a related question. Jeshu, if you'd like to take this one from uh, Mr. Uh, Ruyal Mia. Uh, do the market access barriers, example, the lack of bargaining power, predetermined buyer and seller, crisis, et cetera, undermine the rights and social justice of fishers? If so, how would it be overcome? You can maybe talk about it in the context of the women. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, the rights of women uh, in buying fish and access to fish, uh, which is landed in the harbor, is really restricted or uh, when the big dealers come. So when it is, uh, when, when there's a shift, nowadays there's a shift from fish landing centers to big harbors. So the, all the mechanized boats and the big uh, boats come and land their fish there. And it is bought by the business people and dealers. And here, in, uh, there are some few places where women have formed a collective and negotiated with the uh, boat owners and the associations with the land, saying that the, they should be having a equal access to buy the fish instead of giving to individual business concerns. So in that, they have bought because when it goes to individual business concerns, the women have to go and buy from those concerns and the price varies 
and so they have a very little margin when they take it to the market so when they have formed collective and negotiated and gained the right they are able to buy for themselves so that they can the women vendors can buy from the collectives so in that way that is one just one example to overcome such issues there are many other issues which can be similarly talked about in the market also market also is a place where women come and sell there also they have negotiated with the markets with the government and other places to have their own space uh, and not to um, what is lease it out to the individual business people and then they sublease it to the uh, vendors and collect uh, tax so that kind of systems they have negotiated and they have successfully bargained and they have successfully implemented also thank you thanks jishu uh, we have another question from Enrique Kefalas, who is based in Brazil. Uh, and it's about how, because the session is also about how we can use human rights and the small scale fisheries guidelines in our work um, and to strengthen human rights. So uh, can maybe, uh, Susan, would you like to take this up? How do grassroots organizations use the guidelines to strengthen their struggles? Maybe in the East African context? Uh Thank you very much. Yeah, one of the things that uh, basically we've been doing with grassroots organizations as officials is we've had a lot of um, awareness and sensitization um, sessions right at the grassroots, um, making them understand the guidelines, internalize them, and of course own them so that they find where their place is and where something might not be right. Now, in East Africa, you will find that at times we have a conflict with culture and tradition. But we've been able to bring the guidelines um, to the table with them understanding that they're not demeaning anybody, nor under, are they underrating um, our culture and traditions. So it's been a win-win uh, for both the people at the local level, for the fishermen themselves, who at one point will feel, well, the women want to go above us, because they should get an opportunity to then understand the guidelines and how it works best for them. Thank you, Susan. Uh, You're we have a question from um, for Vivian, actually. Um, sorry, I hope I didn't inter interrupt anyone. Vivian, this is a question about youth. I think one of our audience members found your presentation very interesting. And she asked, in the past years, I've seen that young populations are moving out of the territories of fishing to cities. And when asked, they don't seem interested in becoming fishermen or fisherwomen. What has been your experience in Costa Rica? And how do you think we can address this challenge as cultural heritage is also at risk of being lost? OK, um, thank you. That's a very interesting question. In fact, um, if you uh, see what's happening, in at least in Latin America, that would be what you think is happening. But in a lot of these territories, if you stay long enough, that means if you can see the processes that are happening, you see two very interesting things. One is that um, those young people that moved out for, for uh, some time come back, and others were not able to move out because opportunities were not there. And at the end, they end up being fishers with a very um, frustrated feeling sometimes that they were not able to really deal with their future in the way that it was suspected. But I think there's a, there's a story telling here. And in case of Latin America, it's being told by the very radical environmental organizations, which is we need really to see that people, young people don't want to keep up being fishers. And in fact, we have found those young people that really loved small scale fishing, that really want to move on with the way of life in a, in a high level standard, that means in better, in better conditions for that work. And we have seen that working with them and encouraging this collective work, you know, this governance, that they can actually make decisions, take decisions concerning their territory is interesting. Them. So I would say that we need to work in the field, stay long enough to work with these communities to see the real 
changes that are happening. And I am seeing that at least in the areas that we have worked long enough, instead of being this uh, something that is weakened up, small scale fishers, young people want to do small scale fishing in a better condition. And this is, I think, a very important aspect. And I would recommend to stay longer, work in the field and be with them because I think that we need to buy the right story in the right moment of life. Apologies, uh, I was muted. Um, I was, I'll just repeat that um, because we're already over time um, to our audience members, we will have to close the questions with this final one. So I'll ask all our speakers to perhaps reflect on this particular one, which I'll read out to you. We'll start with Sophie and go in the order of the presentations. Uh, Lena Diaz asks, five years of the SSF guidelines implementation, but the injustices that are being faced by the sector are getting worse. How could we transform this tool as a mandate to really face the human rights violations? I think she means to really address them. Sophie, you want to go first? That's a very powerful uh, and I think uh, needed question that we all need to have uh, some uh, debates about in the future. I would say from, from uh, looking at the SSF guidelines from a national human rights institution perspective and from working with, with, with you, uh, we have realized that uh, actually there are not a lot of human rights organizations and national human rights institutions that really understands the issues of the small scale fishery community and they don't know the SSF guidelines. And I think maybe a lack uh, in terms of really progressing the uh, implement the guideline is about the partnerships and the collaborations that have not yet been established uh, where we can mobilize more resources and more uh, experiences in promoting uh, the implementation of the guideline uh, by making these alliances uh, with actors that you are not normally working with, uh, and, and especially human rights organizations and institutions uh, could make a very important contribution and maybe also uh, broaden the issue and the debate and the awareness of that. I think for me that's a positive uh, step we could take to really uh, move uh, up on the SSF guideline. Thank you. Munir, do you want to go next briefly? Munir, can you hear me? Uh, sorry, uh, yes, thank you very much. But I, 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 I was uh, blackout for a while, for a few minutes maybe. I, I couldn't hear anything from Sophie, especially. Uh, I'll just ask the question again, Munir. The one on yeah. our screens from Lina Diaz about how, despite five years of the guidelines' endorsement and ongoing activities for implementation, injustices against the sector are ongoing, and how can we address this so that it can become a really powerful tool to address these violations? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Very nice, very nice question, and very, very powerful question, in fact. But to us, uh, the, to address these issues and to, to raise the voice of uh, official people, the demand should come from them. And because many of our fishermen, uh, especially this is the example of, of, our, of, of Bangladesh, especially if you go to the remote islands on remote areas of fishing villages, you will, you will, you will, you will see that our fishermen, they don't know about the, what the actual rights they have and what the services are there for them. But if we CSOs and we academicians always raise the issues to the government, this will not be a strong voice. But so we need to educate our fishermen about their rights, about the, the available existed uh, services, and the voices should be come from them. And if they, they can raise their voice, if the, their voice can be raised, uh, uh, if, if, if the demand of human rights, of their particular rights, can be come from fishermen, 
i think that can be a very good and very strong strong tool uh, in this in this regard thank you very much thanks puneet um jeshu a last comment on lena's question or message yeah mm, yes i agree that the voices of the fishing community should come first but uh, just the voices alone doesn't work so though there are uh, the unions raising voices within india many times it's not heard that means we have to give consistently negotiate with the state advocacy we have to play a role of advocacy all the i think the un organizations to, should play a advocacy role to make the uh, government implement it or make it mandatory um so such type of steps can strengthen um so reduce the injustice and other human and fisheries movement should link with other movements of human rights organizations and take up the issues also so networking advocacy and other things may will help that's what i try to say thank you thanks jeshu i think that's an important point about expanding to links and collaborations uh alliances with many other networks as we see globally uh, but also nationally uh susan would you like to go next responding to lena's comment unmute uh unmute. i am unmuted now thank you yeah just to add on or to strengthen uh, what has already been said by my fellow panelists i think most sensitization at the grassroots for them to understand there should be an ownership or a buy in by all the actors um and like munir has said they need to raise um the concern in regards to to the human rights um issues that they they are undergoing uh right on the ground now transformation is a process it takes time so we don't need to give up on it but i also agree um with the rest that bringing on board more organizations more actors more players more people who are relevant to understand and be able to buy in to the conversation would then um help us because i find when i find people talking about human rights you find that some are very biased to which area of human rights and they do not understand for example the fisheries sector so if we could also educate and sensitize um the other partners um i think that would then help us be able to achieve um the global success of of ssf guidelines thank you god i keep doing this because we don't know where that disturbance is coming from uh vivian you're the last speaker would you like to comment on this uh are you not able to see the uh, question thank you thank you okay. no i'm i'm uh, this is a very interesting question and of course i think that implementation has to happen at different levels right at the international level national level and the question is going directly to the to the local level which is a very important one and the one we are more pressed to see the differences happening I uh, think that one of the key issues is actually to maintain the guideline in the hands of fishers and fisher organizations. I think that this is a very important issue and um as I heard it from a fisher once, you know, we don't want the guidelines to be sequestrated, you know, or um taken from our hands. I think that's a very important issue because that will be the only way that the guidelines will be implemented at the local level. If communities in fishers uh young fishers women um fishermen are able to understand in their own perspective in their own way and interpret what the guidelines are saying to put in place into the field now it is also very important for at the governmental level to have a framework a law framework that can guarantee these rights and i think that also has to be one of our norms um long term is um 
it's closer now with the pandemic, I think, for all of us, you know, but I think that um, we really need to see this, as was said by the other panels, as a long-term process. And that process might not have an end because we might not be able to see these differences, but communities will do. Human rights-based approaches will be seen in the well-being of people in the very, very concrete issues. And sometimes it might differ from culture to culture. So I think we need to have in mind the diversity of small-scale fishers, the need to have in their organizations and in their hands the guidelines, and to fight for what Jesu was saying, you know, this issue of strengthening the collective governance of the territories of life is the most certain way in which we are going to see the human rights-based approach implemented. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivian, for those last comments, which are so inspiring and, of course, uh, very, very relevant. Thank you to all our speakers for your presentations, which are so rich and informative. Um, I just want to close by, I don't want to take up more time, I'll hand it over to Ratna, but just by thanking all the co-organizers of this session, including the IHR, FAO, World Fish, the IPC Fisheries Working Group, the presenters, of course, and their organizations, and my colleagues at ICSF. Um, with that, thank you to TBTI and Ratna. I'll just take myself off, and why don't you close the session? Thank you, everyone. Oh, that's such an interesting and very engaging conversation we just had. I just didn't even want to interrupt that. But uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we agree on meeting again tomorrow so that we can continue with the conversation? So thank you so much, all the speakers, for your sharing your experience, uh, for the audience, for that very engaging conversation, and also special, special thanks um, to Manas and organizing uh, team. That was a very interesting session. And we would continue uh, uh, tomorrow with the Blue Justice session. Some of these similar questions would be also addressed there. And of course, the Small Scale Fisheries Guidelines session itself would be aired on Monday as well. So join us again live. So all the videos are recorded and they are, you can watch them later if you are interested. And for now, I will just say goodbye until tomorrow.